Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Adventures, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Southeast Asia pack and reviewing all the animals that we got through that pack. So this pack had eight animals, hence why it was the animal pack. We have one exhibit animal, the giant malayan leaf insect, and we have the seven other habitat animals, which I'm really excited to get into. But first, we'll just start with the habitat animals, see if we can find ourselves a little... Little one. There's one there. Let's take a looky loo. We can go and handle and take a look. Oh no. There we are. And Hansel. Should we find it? Where is it? Ooh, I see it. I see one at least. So these, let's see, the camouflage works pretty well if I'm struggling to find one. Let's see if we can find one. I'll try again. So there it is. There it is, we'll go into Ansel again. So look, see how hard that is to find? Incredible. Trying to get close enough. It's kind of hard to do it with Anzel, but let me take a looky load. So these guys are pretty cool. Giant Malayan leaf insects. I think we'll get out of Anzel. See if we can find a better one. Oh, there's one there. We can grab that one. Sorry for taking that time, but I just needed to find it. Let's look. There it is. Need to get it right. Just right. See if you can zoom in or anything. Camera. get a good look at it there so that's the giant malayan leaf insect so what's really cool about giant malayan leaf insects is that clearly they look like a leaf because it took me a little while to find one <laughs> so um yeah these giant malayan leaf insects also known as the scientific name is philium giganteum are found in malaysia and western uh, uh borneo i think and these are the largest species belonging to the genus. They get to about 105 millimeters long, so a little over about 10 centimeters, which is pretty, pretty big. And they're found around the West Malaysian tropics. And the females have these big, like, um, look like leaves as camouflage or protection from predators. And sometimes transparent, that's really cool. So these in the wild have been found tit normally are actually females and we don't really know about the male of these species but we know that they can reproduce parthenogenically or parthenogenesis which means they can give birth just by themselves they just create clone of themselves they don't need another male it's asexual reproduction and the eggs of these guys tend to be uh brown or black or glossy to resemble the looks of seeds so that also avoids predator trying to avoid them and they hatch about six months after births and these young nymphs uh, tend to be wingless and brown and reddish and they develop their green pattern after feeding on the leaves and these guys all mainly feed on plants and they really like oak and barbel tree leaves so yeah I think this is a wonderful cool guy look at this wonderful man Let's see if we can find another one to get a good look at we're going to take some time and just appreciate these insects because these guys are cool I did it so what other things we can find. There's got to be one that we can spot easy somewhere. See, they clearly do a good job at hiding. But now nah, that's wonderful. So now we're going to move on to the next species. We have got the... Probably my least favourite of the pack, and I'll tell you why. 
and got the Malayan Tapir. And the Malayan Tapir, also known as the Asian Tapir or Piebald Tapir, is the only Tapir from the Old World, which means they live in Asia and clearly live in Southeast Asia as well. They tend to be found around Sumatra and Malaysia. And these guys get pretty big. They can get up to about 1.8 to 2.5 meters in length and stand about 90 to 110 centimeters tall and weigh between 230, 250 and 320 kilograms. So these guys are pretty big. Biggest out of the tapir species, which in the game they seem to be literally the same size as the Brad's tapir. These guys are also uh, give birth, uh, have a gestation period about 390 to 395 days when they give birth to an offspring that looks like this and is very cute. You can see here, look at this, that was cutie. Very, very cute. And they have this camouflage pattern to help them break their outline in the forest so they don't get drawn attention to by predators. So adult Malayan tapirs are pretty solitary and live on their own, just marking their own territories and such. And they can communicate with squeals and whistles. Oh, look at you having a sleep. And they usually live near water and bathe and swim. They're very, very like swimming and stuff. And they are mainly active at night, but they're not exclusively nocturnal. So they will come out and eat during the sunset, after sunset or sunrise, and often nap in the middle of the night. So they are considered crepuscular. And yeah, the thing about these guys is that in the wild, they uh, live in lowland rainforests around Sunda, uh, Sumatra, Malaysia, Myanmar, and Thailand. And Borneo may have persisted, but are pretty much considered to have gone extinct now. Uh, the sad thing is about these guys is that these guys often suffer from habitat loss from a lot of clearing of the forests that live in the areas that they live. So they are subject, they are considered endangered since they are at great risk of habitat loss. But yeah, the thing about this guy is, is that it doesn't really look like a Malayan tapir. This has been a big point of contention for the whole since it was revealed mm. and honestly it does see look this is a they made a sign that looks like a proper malayan tapir you can see here it's got this longer face and rounder back and this guy's literally just a beard's tapir they really didn't put that much effort into changing this guy they literally just made it the same which is a real big shame and i hope they change it like they did the Benturong. i can imagine that could be something in a free update or something or uh, even just a part of an update of this pack, so I'm a little bit disappointed in this one. We can have a look at this guy, maybe we can go back and have a look at the... Um, there isn't really much on this guy's Wikipedia, it just tells you that they, what I told you. So that they live around Java, Sumatra, Malaysia, and Borneo. Look at all that. Really doesn't change much, literally just what I said. Uh, we can find the Malayan tape here. Go in this guy's Wikipedia. So the Malayan tapir is a mammal native to rainforests of Southeast Asia, as I mentioned. Then pretty much all the facts that I just mentioned. We'll have a quick look through here. See, look, they can be found around Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. So you have but two males, so they're monogamous. No worries. Male tapirs are often solitary, but may be found in monogamous pairs. And yeah, I'm a young offspring or in temporary feeding groups. They're tolerant of other individuals, so that's good. So fun fact, Malayan tapir is the largest tapir species. Infant tapir, yeah, I mentioned that. Uh, Malayan tapirs will often walk along riverbeds underwater for up to 90 seconds, so that would be cool to see in the game. Uh, the Malayan tapir is the only species of tapir native to Asia, with all other species living in Central and South America. The reason for that is, is that they used to live across North America as well. They used to have a very, very much wider distribution. But during the latest Ice Age and a lot of other factors, they kind of just dwindled down into these isolated populations. So there's like one species, well, there was two species. The giant tapir lived until 4,000 years ago in Asia and then the rest lived in South America. And the Malayan tapir's vision is very poor and rely mainly on scent and hearing to navigate the surroundings. And let's see what this guy goes out with. So this guy goes with a lot of things. You can see he goes with the Binturong, the Borneo orangutan, the Indian elephant, and the proboscis monkey. So yeah, clearly this guy goes with a lot. I like how I like I like this that this pack has a lot of different animals that go together. So that's the cool thing to me. 
so now we're going to move on to the next animal. We're going to move on to the doll. This is meant to be the Usari doll, which is the nominate subspecies. And yeah, it looks much better than the. It isn't just a ripoff of the uh, any other species in the game, but I think this guy could use a little bit of an update. So these guys are also known as the Asian wild dog, or the whistling dog, or the mountain wolf. These guys are canins their own genus, not related to canis, but they close closely related to species, but they're quite distinct. So these guys during the Pleistocene they ranged across Asia, Europe, and parts of North America until being restricted to pretty much Asia between 12,000 and 18,000 years ago. So these guys are very, very social of these high dominance hierarchies and live in tropical rainforests with groups up to 12 individuals and up to 40. So that you can have these really big groups. And they compete with tigers and leopards for food. And they're considered endangered as the population uh, is decreasing and estimated to contain fewer than 2,500 mature individuals, which sucks. Factors contributing to this decline is obviously a lot of things affecting a lot of other species like habitat loss, competition with other species, uh, disease transfers from mess dogs is a big one, and prosecution due to killing livestock. So yeah, these guys are found all across uh, pretty much India, uh, Nepal, Sumatra, and Southeast Asia. And the species, this is meant to be the Usari uh, red wolf, or the just the Usari doll, which is found the east of the eastern Russia and northeastern Asia. There's lots of different subspecies, but they're kind of just been lumped into two or three. And they are very, very distinct looking because they have a very... It doesn't really show it on this doll as I get into. They have a very, very, like, uh, developed sagittal crest. They have, like, a very hyena-like face, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, these guys can be found around Tibet and possibly around North Korea and Pakistan. They used to live pretty much all across Asia, but due to prosecution and all those other factors I mentioned before, they now pretty much exclusively live in southern parts of their range now. Oh, I assume there's reintroduction programs in the works, hopefully. They may persist in southern Siberia, but we really don't know, but they are protected. So yeah, they kind of have a very scattered distribution across Asia, which kind of sucks. So these guys are more social than grey wolves and have less of a dominance hierarchy, so they kind of just live in clans. So they kind of just hang out together and they break apart and do their own thing. Uh, they're far less territorial as well, and their pups often join another um, another group without any issues, so they can just kind of just move and do their own thing. They're a lot less tied together, they're not like wolves, they're not quite as tied together, which is pretty cool. So these guys in the mating season occurs around mid-October and January, where these dolls uh, kind of come together and make all these whistling sounds, which is quite cute. Uh, the pups are suckled once they're born, they tend to last about uh, 58 days and then their father needs, their mother feeds them in the den and they do not really have rendezvous sites like the wolves do but they will, but adults will stay with the pups in the den since there's so many of them. Once they wean, the clan will regurgitate food for the pups and they will eventually start about 7 to 80 days and at the age of 6 months they kind of just go and join hunts. Uh, and the maximum age captivity has been noted to be 15, 16 years. And the really interesting about these guys is how they hunt. Because these guys just pretty much just gang anything. They'll hunt, noct they don't hunt nocturnally, but they often hunt during the day. And they rely on sight to win the hunt. And then they're not as fast as jackals and foxes. They chase their prey, they're very similar to wolves in that regard. And yeah, they kind of just, when they attack, they just attack. Pretty much everywhere they try to open their tear open the flanks they try to rip out their intestines and time disavow the enemy which is really really scary actually and these guys will pretty much feed on anything they'll feed on sambar deer chitali manjak mouse deer wild boar water buffaloes gaur ghost uh goats indian hares uh the mouse and even a record of a pack you bring me back and uh bringing down an indian elephant calf so yeah they pretty much just eat on whatever large animals live in their habitat and they have been not known to attack people, surprisingly, and also will eat fruit and vegetables more readily than other uh, canids, which is pretty cool. 
So yeah, the issue with these guys is, as I mentioned before, fur trade as well, since there was a huge fur trade, though that has died down a lot. Also, competition with livestock, because livestock takes away their prey, and obviously they can't hunt the livestock, otherwise people get angry, and things like that. And there has been efforts to try and preserve them, and they have been doing and are protecting a lot of their range, so it's really just trying to get them to bounce back, really. But the thing is, is this kind of doesn't really look like a doll, honestly. You can see, if you look at the back legs here, it kind of looks a little bit over-muscled. The face looks way too jackal-like. If you look at a doll, it kind of has like a really, really boxy face. And they kind of made it a bit too thin here. I think this could do, along with the Malayan Tapia, some updates. Also, the uh, ears are much too pointy. It feels more like a jackal than a doll. So I feel like there could be some updates there just to round it out a little bit. But yeah, we can also have a look at the cute puppies. Look at these cute puppies. Look at them go. I think that's adorable. I think that is very adorable. Even though they're not exactly the rightest, but they're very, very cute. So yeah, that's the doll. Probably one of the least favourite of the pack. Could use some updates like the tapir, but overall pretty great. It's nice to see an animal like that, because I love dolls. They're really underrepresented, I think. And guess what? We have got another animal coming up. We have the North Sulawesi Barbarossa. You can look at this big male here. Look at this guy. I like that guy. We I keep forgetting, we need to have a look at the Zoopedia. Let's have a look at the Zoopedia for this guy. Oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. That's alright. So these guys, population of the wild, as I mentioned. You can see their range here. Pretty spot on. Java, India, Nepal, around there. 2 to 25, so you can have pretty big groups with these guys. Which is pretty cool. Uh, 2 to 25. Dolls are a keystone species, which means they're extremely important to maintaining ecosystems in the habitat. Just like all keystone predators and big predators. They do not bark and howl like other dog species, but they whistle, which is pretty cool. The doll packs have been known to bring down prey ten times the size, as I mentioned. Dolls have different dentition to all other dogs. It is thought that may help them eat their prey faster to prevent kills being stolen by competition, as they do compete with leopards and tigers. And humans who live in jungles have been known to follow dolls to track prey because they are such effective hunters. And that does not surprise me. So yeah, let's get back to uh, big boy here. I love the Babarusa. So the North Sulawesi Babarusa oh, is a pig-like animal native to Sulawesi and some of the neighboring islands. There are three different species of Babarusa. This is the particular um, North Sulawesi Babarusa. So these guys get to about 85 to 100 centimeters uh, long and weigh up to 100 kilos, so they're quite big animals. They're pretty much hairless, as you can see, and have these really, really weird long curved tusks, which a very famous fact about them is that if they don't keep them trimmed, it'll grow into their skull and kill them. So that's probably not the most fun thing to imagine. So in the wild, this kind of will maintain itself through rubbing and stuff but in the zoos where they are kept sometimes you might need to do it for them have a look at the females that doesn't have one and i really like how this one came out. um so in their habitat they live in tropical rainforests and at the shores of rivers and lakes they uh have these two pairs of tusks in that and they are threatened but but they are protected by law but they are often hunted for like bush meat and such so they are protected at least and they can be found in different zoos around the world, but they are very inbred. Like, um, Bronx Zoo, uh, Los Angeles Zoo, Chester Zoo, and they're pretty, pretty cool. And the thing about other Babarusa is that one of them is not even really known, like, the, uh, what's the one, the... Buru Babarusa, I think it is. There's one of them, I'm not sure what species it is, but they are very, very hard to find. It's they're like almost like a lost species. So we don't know where they are. Can I just to say, this is really, really cool animal. I really like how this guy came out. I really like how they're doing more detailed like, furless animals, because they really put a lot of detail into the furless animals. And it comes out really, really well. Where's the. 
Where's the baby? We need to find the baby. Look at this little piglet. It's gotta be another one. <laughs> Look at the baby. Look at you. Look at you, aren't you cute? Look at this little boy. I really love the baby. Um, Babarusa looked very cute. See if you get your comments of light. Look at you. Aren't you adorable? Very, very adorable. A lucky, lucky, lovey. Gonna jump down. <laughs> okay, so that's the Babarusa for us. Now we're going to move on to the monkey of the pack. We have got the proboscis monkey. You see this looks like a... Ooh, jumped in. This looks like a female. So, these guys are quite famous. Uh, these guys, also known as the long-nosed monkey, live in the old world, obviously, since they live in Borneo. They live in mangrove forests around uh, Borneo. And they are very good swimmers, which is pretty cool. So these are a very, very large monkey species. These are one of the largest old world monkeys, if not the largest. And they can get up to about 30 kilos, and a big male can get to about uh, 76 centimeters in length. And females are generally a lot smaller. They get up to 62 and weigh 7 to 12 kilos, with a maximum weight of 15. So you can see what really points out that dimorphism is that the males have these very, very big noses that they... Uh, used to make sounds it's kind of like a resonating chamber so these guys live in groups of about one adult males some adult females and the offspring and that some batch of the groups do exist and they live in a fusion fusion fission society so they kind of just move as they want to they can swap groups or join up groups will, uh, split apart groups will just do whatever really it's pretty cool so yeah, females become sexually reproductive about five years, and that's when they uh, breed about largely around February and November, while births occur in May and March. And this is kind of where they have these vocalizations, and the males will uh, present their backsides and shake their heads to the females, and the females present their backsides to the males, and <laughs> that's quite funny. And they make all sorts of cool vocalizations that you can see in the game, hopefully. Any and these guys found a Borneo and just live in these really cool, like, mangrove forests. They live in riverine habitats and found in swamps, so they're very, very good swimmers. I hope you can see one swimming. That'd be kind of cool. And these guys kind of just eat what's available. They eat whatever fruits they can find in their swampy habitat. And these guys are preyed on by animals like crocodiles, monitor lizards, clouded leopards, eagles, and pythons. So you got to be very careful of that. And they are sadly considered endangered. They, uh, their population has decreased by more than 50% in the past 40 years, often due to habitat loss and oil plant plantations, which is a big issue in those areas. So, And also their populations are very fragmented, so that means their populations are isolated, which is not good. But there are proboscis monkeys can be found in a bunch of different protected areas, so that's very, very good. And yeah, I just really love this guy. You can see the big male here, and then we'll have a look at the juvie. Where's the juvie? Where's the juvie? Where's the juvie? The juvie male. Here's one. Look at the sleepy. Look at that little face. Oops. I just love their big pot bellies. Because they are herbivores, they have these big pot bellies to help digest food. And I think it looks really cool on them. You can see this as a female. Oh, you coming? They kind of like jumped into each other. You can see this <laughs> adult male female juvenile. So yeah, this is the proboscis monkey, a very very cool boy. And we're gonna move on to the next animal. We have got the everyone's favorite cat. We have got the clouded leopard. <coughs> So there are two species of the clouded leopard. These the mainland clouded leopard and the Sunda clouded leopard. I believe this is the mainland one. 
So these guys are found through Himalayas uh, and Southeastern Asia and Southern China. And these guys genetically diverged from uh, the common ancestor of Felidae, which is the other big cats like lions and tigers, about nine million years ago. And several million years ago, they reached Sunderland, which divided into the Sunder clouded leopard versus the this one is just a regular clouded leopard. So yeah, uh, these guys are very famous for having these very very big teeth, uh, very almost like very saber tooth like. And I think that's really, really cool. They're also the closest, kind of, not really closely related, but they are the, like, the most basal member that split off before uh, Macarodontus and all those groups, the Macarodonts. And these guys have these very, very splotched patterns around them to help them uh, hide in the, break the outline in the forests and make sure they hide themselves. And these guys can be found everywhere mentioned they originally exist uh extinct in singapore and taiwan but they do live in other places like malaysia thailand bangladesh and the, uh, nepal bhutan and india and these guys are solitary and they just hunt wherever they can they can climb vertical trees and stuff and can even supernate and helps them climb down branches and supernate their wrists and like other cats, they tend to scent mark a lot of things. And here's a little baby. You can have a little baby. Do a lot of scent marking. And the shows that they are crepuscular, like other cats, so they can come out not really during the night, but they will come out during early afternoon and um, late, uh, early after, uh, late afternoon and early morning. And these guys pretty much eat whatever they can. They've been known to prey on slorises, hog deer, porcupines, pangolins, squirrels, munjacks, barking deer, and even have been known to have a binturong in their claws, so that's pretty weird. So once they reach about 26 months old, that's when they're ready to reproduce. A female gets an estrus in a, for about six days, and estrus cycle lasts about 30 days, where the male mate around March. Uh, to December and the pair mate multiple times of two days and that's when the female gets pregnant and has a litter of one to five with a gestation period of about 93 days. Cubs were bought, generally born about 109, uh, 140 to 280 grams and the spots solid dark with darker rings very similar to kind of like how this looks here and after 10 days their eyes open and be active and fully weaned within three months of age. And the captive population have been lived for 11, average 11 years, and a, one captive has been lived for 17. So one really big issue with these guys is that it's most of the forests that remain are too small to support populations. And the fur trade is obviously a big thing because they have these really wonderful patterns and a lot of people want to put them into coats and stuff, which is terrible. And... There have been conservation efforts to protect them. They are considered endangered under the Endangered Species Act, and either trading any of the animals' parts is prohibited and illegal. And they have stable uh, breeding programs, at least, so in captivity. So we have a backup population, but still a really wonderful guy. I think we'll go back quickly because I keep forgetting to check the. Uh... No, I won't worry about it. We'll just go and talk about the animals. I keep forgetting to bring up the. Uh... Zipedia, but if you want to get the pack and do it for yourself, why not? It's just usually most. I'm still on my like uh, mod spotlight mindset, so I keep forgetting to bring it up because usually they don't have any. But yeah, we're going to talk about this wonderful guy who caused a lot of controversy, of course. We have got the Binturong. Now, if you all remember what happened with the Binturong, <laughs> that was a bit wild. The original look, everyone was like, that doesn't look like a Binturong, it looks like a Binturong. So they, then they went back and updated it, and it looks great. Honestly, I had no issue with the other one. It fit the Planet Zoo style, but I'm really glad they went through and made it better, because I think it really okay. does look better. So they really just updated the face and everything a little bit, and I think it looks great. So yeah, the Binturong, is so known as the Bear Cat, is a Viverid from Southeast okay, Asia, Mama. and is considered vulnerable. So they have these really long um, bodies, along with the uh, prehensile tail that they use to climb. 
And the weird thing everyone says about them is that they smell like popcorn because they have scent glands that when they obviously make a scent, sound like popcorn, which is really funny. So these guys uh, can get about head to body length with a tail of 71 centimeters. So they can get like quite long. So the body length is uh, 76 to 91 centimeters and head to body length. And the captive uh, adult female can weigh about 21 kilos with a range of 11 to 32 kilos. The males are actually slightly bigger. The males can get up to about 84 centimeters uh, in length. Very, very big. And these guys obviously found everywhere, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, all that. And all of those areas, Borneo as well. And they tend to live at elevations uh, from 220 to 280 uh, feet or meters. And kind of just be found up to uh, 1,000 meters in elevation. And there's been, what's cool is that there's been several individuals observed feeding on a fig tree and on a vine. So they kind of just do whatever, wherever they live. And also have been known to live in palm estates because obviously they have to survive somehow with all the logs, all the logging and palm oil going on. So they just try and find habitat where they can. But they do prefer to live uh, in primary forests. So these guys are also active during the day and night and kind of just go as they as they want. And tracking shows that they pretty much active where they can. And look at this cute little animation. He's just hanging out, hanging out. I'm glad we got to see this animation. So these guys are pretty much crepuscular, so they come out during the midday and late afternoon, just kind of whenever they want to come out. And they move about 0 0.9 kilometers around and they have slightly different ranges depending on the availability of food or where they're looking for females and are pretty much arboreal look at that i think that's wild i think that's cool so these brinterong also use their tail to communicate if they move it gently often coming to a stop that means they try to keep their balance and also comfort with grooming their fur shaking and licking their hair and scratching so that's why they kind of look like bear cats and act like cats. They're very, very interesting group of animals, and I love Binturongs. They're a cutie. They're a queen. Let's see if we can find a the baby. There's the baby. The baby. He he's sleeping. So these guys are omnivorous, so they literally eat whatever they can. They can eat small mammals, uh, fish, earthworms, insects, fruits, rodents, and. They don't really eat fish and earthworms because they don't really live in the ground or <laughs> in the water. But they will eat when they kind of just, when they get the opportunity. Figs are a pretty major point of some diets and Captain Binturong would be known to eat uh, eggs and stuff. And they're also very important for egg dispersal, like strange strangle effects. They often, through their guts, they spread their seeds. And the age of sexual maturity is about 30 uh, months and for, fem for females and 27 for males. The extra cycle lasts between 18 and 187 days with an average of 82.5 days and gestation lasts about 84 to 99 days. When these two babies are born, they can be born between 1 to 6 with an average of 2 and neonates are usually about 283 to 340 grams and often uh, referred to as shruggles, which I think is very cute. And fertility lasts about 15 years of age, and the maximum lifespan has been known to be about 25 years. So they're quite long lived for, in comparison. So, along with a lot of many of these animals, I kind of sound like a broken record, but a lot of these issues for these guys is de habitat loss and degradation of forests through logging and palm oil plantations, and also having often catch the wildlife, uh, wildlife trade for human consumption, which is pretty, pretty sad. And we don't want to see any of that. And some people actually keep Binturong as pets, which is a bit wild. And they're considered a delicacy in Vietnam, so they need to be maintained. Um, and yeah, they're considered uh, vulnerable. So their population has declined, but they're still very much... So there are populations that are, like in China, they're considered critically endangered and are completely protected in a lot of areas, or partially in some. 
And there is also World Binturong Day, an event that takes every second Saturday of May. So how can you not love the Binturong? I think he's a cool boy. I think it's a story of how these guys frontier listen to us and fix the Binturong. And I like these guys very, very much. I think they're some of the coolest boys. And yeah, let's start with the lucky list, but not last. Definitely not least, we've got the Sun Bear. Look at this wonderful guy. I really like how this one came out. So, these guys are found in the tropical forest of, you guessed it, Southeast Asia. They are the smallest bear, nailing about 70 centimeters at the shoulder and about 65 kilos, with this very, very lean coat. It's very stockily built with uh, strong curved claws, rounded ears, and a short snout and a very very long tongue. So these guys are the most arboreal of the bears and kind of like living in trees and such. And some bears are sleep in trees two to seven meters above the ground. They're nocturnal during the day but in areas with humans they tend to be more uh, nocturnal so they avoid people. And they can be found in solitary or in pairs. And unlike a lot of bears they do not hibern hibernate because food resources are available all year round. So they can just kind of just forage and do what they like. And these guys eat everything. They eat ants, bears, uh, bee, not be you know, the bears. They eat ants, bees, beetles, honey, uh, honey, termites, fruits, vegetables, deer, birds, literally everything. And these guys range from northeastern India, or yeah, to northern extents to Bangladesh, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and other parts of Southeast Asia. And the big issue with these guys also as well is the wildlife trade. Especially things like bear bile and of course habitat degradation. So that's an issue that's affected all these species. So these guys are pretty shy and reclusive unless you kind of attack them and they just want to do their own thing. And they'll often stand on their hind legs to try and um, get a bit of view and they often give these really cool uh, vocalizations they will grunt and sniffle and also give roars similar to those of a male orangutan during the breeding season and may bark like a rhinoceros so they have very interesting uh, see he's probably gonna climb up to this so that'll be pretty cool or he's interacting with the baby Okay, so these guys will literally eat everything. Figs, they're also very important for, like the binturong, for spreading seeds and stuff with other animals. I mean, not other animals, other plants. So that means they can spread it. They don't just fall right next to the road next to the tree, so it helps promote biodiversity in the ecosystems. And they uh, breed throughout the year. And estrus lasts about five to seven days, and they sexually mature about two to four years old. Pregnancies last between 95 uh, to 240 days and birth occurs in hollow tree cavities and the litter can be one to two cubs with about 325 grams and cubs are born deaf with their eyes closed. The eyes open around 25 days but may remain blind until 50 days of birth and their sight increases over that time. Cubs younger than two months are dependent on external simulation for defecation so their mother will lick them and they're kept in there until they can learn to walk and move properly. Mothers will protect their grub, uh, cubs aggressively and they remain with their mother for the first three years of their life and they can live generally over two years, 20 years, I mean, and one individual can live for nearly, has lived for nearly 31 years. So yeah, these guys are considered, I believe, vulnerable, yep, they're considered vulnerable. So they're at risk and are protected in, from hunting in all parts of their range. Though obviously issues with uh, habitat loss and degradation has been a big issue for them since they need a lot of habitat to survive. And there have been works on creating populations in um, captivity, but a lot of them are in, obviously in temperate zoos, which aren't as tropical as these zoos, so they do have some issues, but they have been working on some breeding programs to help these guys because I think they're a very cool species. I remember going to Ronga Zoo when I was younger and seeing some sun bears and they were very very weird looking. 
And yeah, I think this concludes our uh, episode. So this has been a really fun little pack. I really hope to see more of these guys in like animal packs for areas that I think need more animals. South America and Australia, I think, need an animal pack. I also think Africa needs an animal pack. Maybe Europe and North America. So basically one animal pack for each continent. And I think pretty much everyone will be well represented. So yeah, this has been a fun one. I really like these animals. I just think that these two need a bit of an update, but everyone else is pretty good. Really cool to see the Binturong get updated. So yeah, I think this would be a good place to end the video. So I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click that little bell icon so you get notified whenever I upload anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys like and subscribe and bye bye